Well, we're together again, and we're spending more time in seasons. We've looked at this idea of seasons, that seasons are inevitable in all of our lives. And many times, when a season isn't what we expect, we question the providence of God. But seasons are appointed times where God is always in control. So we need to find him and trust him. In the book of Galatians, we saw that, that we have an effect on some seasons that are coming. He said, keep on do, doing good for in due season we'll reap a harvest. I recognize that what I'm doing today affects the seasons that are coming in my future. If I sow sparingly, I'll reap sparingly. If I sow generously, I'll reap generously. Last week, we looked at a season or the reality of the words of Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes where he's talking about times in our lives. And we talked about the very necessary time for us to speak. We are called to be his witnesses. We are called to be the ambassadors of Christ. And he needs us to deliver his message. There's a time to speak. When I told my wife I'm going back to that verse this week and I'm preaching on what comes before that in this verse, that there's a time to be silent. She said, you're going to cause confusion, but there is confusion in this. There's a wrestling in, in this that we all need to be going through and in understanding that there is a time to speak, but importantly, there's a time to be silent. There's some examples in scripture where people just, maybe they should have been silent. Remember the story of Joseph? In Genesis chapter 37, he has these dreams. And, and when he has these dreams, he must go before his brothers. He goes before his brothers and tells them his dreams. And the first time he tells them, it says in Scripture that they hated him all the more. They were already envious of the relationship he had with his father. And now he's telling them a dream that their, their sheaves are going to bow down to his sheave. And they hate him all the more. So what happens? He has another dream. And what does he do? He proceeds to tell his brothers again the dream. I wish someone would have counseled Joseph, hey, buddy, there might be a time to be silent. You know, the first one I can give him credit for, but when he saw the response and what it caused, probably the second time he needs to be silent. If you're not convinced of that one, in the New Testament, Jesus is talking about what is about to come. He's talking about his death that is about to come. And in Matthew chapter 16, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Probably one of the greatest rebukes we see in all of Scripture, Peter is speaking what? He's speaking human concerns. He's allowing his tongue to be driven by his flesh. He's allowing his tongue to speak what his flesh wants to cry out. Jesus Christ knows that there are godly plans that have to be accomplished. He's been telling them for a while, this season is coming. And when Peter begins to rebuke, or when he pulls him aside, Jesus responds and says, get behind me, Satan. You see, there's a time to be silent. And Jesus, in the next chapters, he models this silence. In Matthew chapter 26, he, he, he's standing on trial. People have accused him of things he didn't do. They're trying to find false witnesses to speak against him, but they didn't find any. Though many false witnesses came forward, finally two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But it says in verse 63, Jesus remained silent. In the midst of the accusations, in the midst of the false testimonies, Jesus remained silent. Later on in, in chapter 27, he's standing trial before the governor. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was asked or accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. First Peter summarizes these chapters. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. There's a time to be silent. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. 
Jesus recognized that this moment, the moment of his trial, the moment of accusations, the moment uh, of false allegations, he needed to remain silent. There's a time to be silent. We need discernment to know when to be silent. The books of wisdom, the, the, the writers of wisdom in the Old Testament, they talk about this several times. I just want to read a few verses from the book of Proverbs. When there are many words, wrongdoing is unavoidable. But one who restrains his lips is wise. There's a time to be silent. Whoever derides their neighbor has no sense, but the one who has understanding holds their tongue. There's a time to be silent. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. There is a time to be silent. The lips of the fool bring them strife and their mouth invites a beating. The mouths of fools are their undoing and their lips are a snare to their very lives. Wisdom cries out in the Old Testament that there is a time for us to be silent. Fools in the Old Testament are synonymous with those who can't be silent. Wise in the Old Testament are synonymous with those who can use their words very carefully. Why? Look at the account that Matthew chapter 12 shows us. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. A tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speak what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word, idle word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. There's a time to speak, and there's a time to be silent. The thought that I'm accountable for my words, every idle word spoken, I'll have to give an account. Boy, those wisdom writers, they were correct. There's wisdom in watching what I say. Because what did those verses say? The words that are coming out of your mouth are indicators of what is in your heart. Man. There's a time for silence. The book of James, he talks about this tool, this tongue that's in our mouth. The book of James is an interesting one because as they were doing canon, they say it probably falls in line more with wisdom literature than it does the, the, the epistles of the New Testament. But listen to James 1.19. Dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires. In chapter 3, he talks about our tongue. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect and able to keep their whole body in check. We put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us. We can turn the whole animal. Or we take ships, for example. Although they're large and they're driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire. It itself is set on fire by hell. All the animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. This thing in our mouth, it's, it's pretty dangerous. Those words that we're going to be accounted for, we have to give an account for, they set fires. And too often I can relate to when this thing gets out of control and there's a fire that comes. There's devastation. There's hurt. There's frustration that comes simply because I couldn't tame the tongue. I couldn't just be silent. 
You know, candidly, as a pastor, I'm challenged personally. There's many times that, that I can't be silent and I've got to be critical. There's times where I say things that they're just not necessary, but man, I got to say them. And I see the fire that I set. I want to recognize the wisdom. I want to recognize the word that there's a time for me just to be quiet. You know, a quick indicator that I came up with when I'm speaking to gratify the flesh, I probably should be silent. When I'm speaking to glorify God, I probably should speak up. That's this whole thing in a nutshell. There are times when I'm saying it's only for me. It's to bring joy to me. It's to feed the selfishness in me. And those are the moments where I should just be silent. And there are times when I'm afraid. There are times when I don't want to speak. And God just needs me to speak up. Because there's a time. There's a time to speak. I'll end with this, Ephesians chapter 4. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. There is a time to speak, but there's also a time to be silent. As God's children, we should live in discernment. We should want this ship. We should want this being to be directed wherever we need to go. And our tongues need to be submitted to him. The Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, may he turn his face towards you and grant you his peace. And may you discern, may you be wise and know when you're speaking to gratify the flesh or you're speaking to glorify God. Be blessed.